Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. I'm so excited to share my conversation with Greg Mariotti. Greg has an incredibly unique career path, but I don't want this intro to spoil the story of that journey. So I'll just say this. Greg's story will be inspiring to anyone who has dreamed about a career in the arts, no matter what industry they're currently in and no matter how long they've worked there. Greg's story is a reminder that it's never too late to follow your passion. Greg Mariotti works at Vinyl Films, which is Cameron Crowe's production company. You know Cameron Crowe from the iconic movies he has written, directed, and produced, many of which have become part of the cultural zeitgeist in America, like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Say Anything, Singles, my personal favorite, Jerry Maguire, Almost Famous, for which Cameron won an Academy Award for Best Screenplay, Vanilla Sky, Elizabethtown, the documentary Pearl Jam 20, We Bought a Zoo, Aloha, and most recently, a documentary called David Crosby, Remember My Name, which is coming out in theaters on July 19th. Greg wears many hats at Vinyl Films, and one of those hats is that of producer. In fact, Greg was a producer along with Cameron Crowe on the Crosby documentary, which I had the pleasure of seeing at the Seattle International Film Festival before its release in theaters. There are a lot of documentaries being made these days, but this Crosby documentary, which is directed by A.J. Eaton, is really something special. If you are a Crosby, Stills, and Nash fan, or Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young fan, you will enjoy seeing a vulnerable side of David Crosby that I don't think has ever been depicted on camera. But you don't even have to be a fan of Crosby's music to enjoy the film, because at its core, it depicts a wildly charismatic, funny, talented, yet deeply flawed musician coming to grips with the relationships he has damaged over the years while attempting to honor the relationships he's been able to nurture and hold on to. And he does this with brutal honesty and candor. What a privilege it was to sit down with Greg and hear about his journey into the film industry, and also hear about some of the challenges he faced making this documentary. Please enjoy this wide-ranging talk with film producer and Vinyl Films executive, Greg Mariotti. We're here with Greg Mariotti in his office in um, Westwood, Los Angeles, and um, it is uh, it's twentieth floor. It's just it's gorgeous, and the view from his office is uh, pretty impressive. And um, what I what I'd like to do is start off by talking about um, kind of non chronologically the movie. Uh, David Crosby, remember my name? Sure, uh, because I did get a chance to see that at SIF. Um, I, I was at Sundance and I missed it at Sundance, and um, I ran into David Crosby at the uh, artist at the table dinner at Sundance and got my first taste of just how prickly uh, David Crosby could be. Because <laughs> uh, I I'm I hate to admit this, but I'm an approacher. And I'm a little bit starstruck sometimes. And I, I approached him at dinner thinking that, you know, he would talk to me. And, um, I, I just immediately <laughs> recognized that he was not in the mood to, uh, he was talking to someone else. And I think I probably rudely interrupted him and Amy Redford, I think. Um, but that was my first impression in person of David Crosby. Um, so I was intrigued to, see the biopic or the, uh, not the biopic, but the, the documentary, which I got a chance to see at SIF and, um, great movie. And I understand that's not the, may not be the, the final cut or is it the, the final cut that I saw? Yeah, we, we may have tweaked a little here and there. Uh, it's been a, uh, definitely a ongoing process for the last six months, but, uh, you saw for all intents and purposes, the final cut. Uh, there might be just a couple of, of slight tweaks since then. But yeah, it's about a 93-minute film. And uh, it's about David's trials and tribulations, not only his sort of resurgence in the past five years and how creative he's been uh, putting out new records and touring with uh, a couple of different uh, bands, but also look back at his last 50 years and the things that have uh, 
gone well for him in his career and maybe some of the things that that, that could be categorized as regrets and so we we took that approach with the film looking at it sort of as honestly and authentically as we possibly could and the way Cameron and I have always um I guess described the film was David talking directly to you whispering these stories directly to you, the audience, without a filter, without a middleman. And David doesn't really have a filter. And he was really ready to talk honestly about his life. And um, even more so, I think, than what's in his two autobiographies that have been put out over the last you know, 25 or 30 years. So um, that's what we hope to make. Uh, and I think, we, I think we've done that. And we're pretty, pretty proud of what we have, I think. Well, I I was um, I was really impressed with the humility that you see from David Crosby on camera, and his willingness to um, to be part of a process that reveals the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know of of him. You know, and this is true of every human being. I mean, we we all have an ego. Uh, we all have our our detractors, our our enemies. Um, the people that we don't get along with and and he seemed to let it all come in however it was going to come in and at least on camera seemed like he was comfortable with that and that was refreshing as you know someone who watches a lot of documentaries and um, you know knows that sometimes the narrative can be tweaked and controlled a little bit you know for PR purposes but was that your experience with David Crosby that he was pretty open to that that um, vulnerability? Yeah, I think so. So to give you a little history on how the project came together, uh, the director AJ Eaton, uh, his brother is a musician and uh, knew Crosby and introduced him to Crosby maybe five, six, seven years ago, and they flirted with the idea of making a film about Crosby's like last act. And the music and and what he was working on, it wasn't until uh, the director and one of the executive producers, Jill Mazursky, ran into Cameron at J.J. Abrams' office. Uh, Cameron and I were working on Roadies at the time for Showtime, and it was Cameron knows Jill and has for a long time. And um, when Cameron found out they were trying to get a Crosby film off the ground, he was super stoked and just said, "This is how you should make it." You know get Crosby on a couch, talk about the film or talk about his history, I should say, and um, let him, you know, like I said, talk, talk to the audience and just be open and honest. He's one of the most revealing interviews I've ever done uh, over the last, you know, number of years that he'd interviewed him. And then uh, the more they talked, I think Cameron said, listen, I'll do the interviews and I'll do them as a, as a, as a gift to you and to Crosby. So let me know. I'll be happy to do them. We have a longstanding relationship. And, and so, that's what happened. We did our first interview on a Saturday morning after we had worked on roadies all week long, sort of as a fun, different thing to do. And we went down to Jackson Brown's studio in Santa Monica and, 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 and did our first interview with Crosby. And over the next few months, we did a couple additional interviews, again, just strictly as a gift from Cameron to, to AJ and to David. And then they were trying to get financing for the film and AJ had been using his own funds to film and to, and to make uh, the doc. I think they sort of asked Cameron, would you come on board and executive produce the film? And Cameron said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it, but you know, this is the kind of movie I want to make and kind of laid out this no holds barred non talking heads documentary. And uh, we, we were able to find financing with BMG films and what's really serendipity about that is the the executive there, uh, Kathy Rivkin Dom, actually had worked for Cameron during Almost Famous, almost twenty years earlier, and jumped to the chance if you know if Cameron's a producer on this thing, we'll we'll greenlight it. And so at that point, we we did we 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 jumped on board the film, Cameron and I, and we did two or three additional interviews. We went to Ohio, we uh, did some touring. We, we shot him at multiple locations, including up, up at his home. AJ had already captured some really great footage of, of Crosby around his home. And, um, and then we got some more really great stuff on tour. 
and the movie really came together. So that was probably about two and a half years ago. And um, we've been editing the film for probably the last 18 months. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a journey for sure. And, and yeah, back to your original question, uh, Crosby was ready to talk. He was super open and honest. Cameron was the right guy to ask those questions and really dig. And sometimes he'd ask the question on the first interview and he'd come back to it again on the second interview or he'd dig a little deeper on the third. And we would just keep going deeper and deeper with Crosby. And, and, and uh, he is such a camera friendly guy. He's really comfortable in front of the camera. He's well-spoken, he's articulate. He's obviously really super smart, uh, intelligent guy and um, brutally honest yeah. about his mistakes and um, you know what he's done in his life, both good and bad. Yeah, that brutal honesty is, is um, it, it's, I, I think that there are, there's a natural uh, tension in the movie that you have with his health. Um, it, you're kind of like, you're listening to his wife and you're seeing the tears in her eyes as he goes, literally, you know, walks out the door and she doesn't know if she's gonna see him again. And, um, and then you've got the tension of just the relationships that he, the, the damaged relationships that have occurred over the years and the people that you're, you're talking to about him. And, uh, and, and it all came together in, in a very, um, it, it really was emotional at the end. The person that was sitting next to me was a, was a volunteer at SIF and, and as, as the credits went up, she said, wow. You know, I mean, she was, she was very impressed with the film as was I. And what I'd like to know is if this thing starts two and a half years ago, why is it that, you know, just to a lay person like me, who's not in the industry, um, why is it that it takes two and a half years to take, um, that footage and cut it and, you know, put it into the form that we see at the theater? Sure. Uh, it's a good question. It does, you know, first of all, you're, you're filming, so we, you know, you got to wait for him to go out on tour. You know, you want to go to Ohio. You see it on the tour uh, dates and you're like, okay, we should go to Ohio with him and we should do something around Kent State. So that's part of it. And part of it is really finding the story, right? With a documentary, you've got all this archival footage to sift through. And you've got all this new footage uh, that you're doing via the interviews with David and you're trying to find like, what is the best version of this story? We knew we wanted to tell the story about this guy that, um, you know, warts and all, good and bad, what he'd been dealing with in his life. Somebody that that's still around when maybe a lot of his peers are not around any longer. And so just kind of shaping that story. So you 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 literally, you're editing and then you're, you're stopping and you're going and going, well, let's go film a little bit more. And then you go out and you film a little bit more. So it's not quite like a traditional movie where you do all your filming up front, you have a script, you do all your filming up front, you go in the edit bay, you cut to your, your script or to your performances, and then you finish the movie. So we were, we were literally shaping the film as we went. We had definitely an outline of what we wanted to do. We had, we had milestones and mile posts along the way of things we wanted to hit in the film. But Cameron, Cameron spent a lot of time in the edit room with, with AJ, the director, just trying to figure out the right tone of the film. How funny should it be? How serious should it be? How sad should it be? And um, the most important thing, and Cameron said this over and over again, was you have to figure out the, the opening of the film and you have to figure out how the film's gonna end because you kind of know most of what's gonna happen in the middle of the film. And then you have to decide, are you going chronologically through Crosby's life? Are you gonna go back and forth? And so we did, we played with that. We played with like jumping around into different time frames. We played with like, do you put everything in chronological order? And that's ultimately what we ended up with was a mostly chronological film because it just flowed better that way. But the biggest pieces were figuring out how to open the film and how to close the film. And we had a lot of different uh, ideas that we played with. We, we tried a, like a three and a half minute montage of Crosby's life up front, like setting up who this guy was. Because you, you want to make a movie that obviously appeals to the diehard Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young fans and the Birds fans and that. But you also want to make a human film that can touch somebody that maybe 
doesn't have an affinity towards that music. And so we really wanted to do that. And so how do you set up Crosby to somebody maybe that doesn't know who Crosby is? And we did. We tried a bunch of different things. We tried a montage. And Cameron came in one day and said, I, I think we can do it in like four or five title cards. And so he kind of wrote out those cards that open the movie that walk you through Crosby's life in a, f a few paragraphs. And then him and I and the, and the, and the director just we finally landed on this John Coltrane story that we had that was super long. It was like four minutes and we ended up cutting it down. But we thought if we start this film with Crosby telling a story about a musician that impacted him and his life and it's funny and it's poignant and you can see the storyteller that is Crosby yeah. and you can see the vitality in Crosby still at 70 at the time, 76, he's now 77, almost 78. We felt like that's going to get people an idea who this guy is right at the very top of the film. And that was sort of the thing that we we really worked on and worked on and worked on. And then, you know, you take the film to Sundance and you try to sell it and then you try to finish it. So the last six months have really been about finishing the film after we sold it to Sony Pictures Classics. But up until then, yeah, we probably spent a year the previous 12 months really editing the film and, and finding our story. And there's a two and a half version, hour version of the film. There's a, a two hour version of the film. And those versions, there's some really great stuff in those versions, but it's not, it's really not the film that we wanted to make. We really wanted to pare it down to the essential stuff and and this, this story about this man um, who is staying alive via the power of music. Yeah. And the, the power to create music, and so that's what we wanted to tell. Yeah, the the Coltrane story was was great because it what it does is you instantly see the charisma that is David Crosby, and and um, that charisma it just pulls you in, and then the storytelling ability, you know, it pulls you in even more. Um, so I think for for audience members who don't know his music or don't know him, it's it was really a great way to start, you know. You know, to really pull the the audience in that way, uh, universally. Now, what were some of the logistics that you had to deal with that would be perhaps different in a um, you know a screenplay that you write that's just a you know an original screenplay versus a documentary? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like I said, I think that the biggest thing is you've got all of this archival footage that you're sifting through. Like what what archival footage is going to help? tell our story. We knew that Crosby, I always said this, Crosby on the couch with Cameron was our story. And then how do you surround those stories that, that, you know, Cameron asking these questions, Crosby giving these answers, how do you surround that with amazing archival footage that's, that's accentuating the story that you're trying to tell. And so you're sifting through all of these, you know, 50 years worth of stuff. Thankfully, there's not a, there's really not a ton there, it's not like, you know, when Cameron made Pearl Jam 20, they had basically filmed almost every concert, either themselves or through, you know, a fan. Someone had filmed almost every Pearl Jam concert for the past 20 years. And so you've got all of this footage and them on MTV and all these other things. And so that, I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been. We didn't have quite that much archival footage to deal with. But you are, you're trying to use archival footage to help tell your story. And then you're trying to pick what songs are going to help tell your story. And so that's what I think is most different about a documentary and, and like a narrative feature film. And, you know, looking back on it now, I wish we had a, maybe a, a more detailed outline, but we did have a really good idea of what story we wanted to tell. And then as we got through the process, we we realized that like maybe the story of his adopted son, who's a musician that's playing with him now, James Raymond, maybe that doesn't fit into the film. We cut a sequence to that. Maybe Melissa Etheridge and Crosby being a sperm donor for her to, to have kids, maybe that didn't quite fit in the movie. People ask about those those things and maybe they'll end up on the DVD or the the iTunes version, but, but figuring out that stuff really didn't belong in our film and you know just really what was the story we were trying to tell and, and making sure we we always stayed focused on that that's where it's different uh i think than a narrative so where is all that archived footage how do you how access do you it, it? Yeah. yeah i mean a lot of it is you license it there's different places some of it 
uh, you would license like from Warner Brothers or, or Rhino, the, the record label, um, because they own a lot of the CSN, CSNY stuff. Some of it, you, you there's uh, uh, archival footage houses. There's one called Reeling in the Years and there's one called Retro Video. They, over the last 50 years, have bought television episodes of, of you know, music variety shows or, you know, um, you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you say, can we... Can we see the the acceptance speech that the oh. band did? And you just go to all these different sources. You look at the footage, and then you you physically license that and pay for that footage. And that's the other thing when you're making a documentary, you have a budget, and it's not uh, like making a narrative film. It's a it's a very modest budget that you must work within, and that includes your music costs and your clearance of archival footage. The stuff that we're filming, you know, is is the is the easiest and the cheapest because we filmed it. It's just a matter of hiring crew and going out and sitting with Crosby and filming. It's all the other stuff that really adds up. It's the cost of editing. Uh, it's the cost of clearing the music. It's the cost of clearing the archival footage that really hits a documentary budget the hardest. So a as a producer on the film, that was your role? Yeah. Yeah. And so what other roles did you play? You know, you're going to look at our archival footage. Um, what types of other decisions are you making and tasks are you performing as a producer? Yeah, I'd say Michelle Farinola, who works at PCH Films and myself, we kind of handled all the day-to-day -day operations of the film, the budget, the accounting. She would deal with a lot of that, working with the accountants. We have, you know, there's the legal, working with the legal department to make sure everything is being cleared and and there's insurance that you have to get. There's scheduling the shoots and hiring the crew and, um, you know, uh, helping to sell the film, working with the, uh, the, um, the sales agent to help sell the film, finding the right partner for that. Uh, and then, you know, Cam like I said, Cameron and I spent a lot of time in the edit room. You know, Cameron's so great with like, you know, telling a story and how to edit to that story that he's trying to tell and working with AJ, a younger director on kind of how to do that the, in, in the best possible ways and finding the right songs to fit a sequence. And Cameron had some great ideas. So we used this song going back during the Laurel Canyon sequence. It's a bird song. And it's a song that the birds recorded after Crosby was fired. It was a song that famously Crosby didn't like and refused to perform on when they were <laughs> recording the album and Cameron thought it was the perfect song to have playing during the Laurel Canyon sequence when he's walking around looking at the photos on the wall and yeah. talking about the the myths around Laurel Canyon and Laurel Canyon Country Store and so just great ideas like that and you know not always picking the most on the nose songs you know we, yes we have so you want to be a rock and roll star from the birds but we also have the song why and we have uh, Lady Friend, which is a great Crosby uh, song from the birds. So just finding the right songs to help tell the story. And and so, you know, a, a, a producer on a documentary is doing kind of a little bit of everything, probably more so than you would on a narrative as well, because you're working with a much smaller crew, a much smaller budget. So you are kind of, you've got your, uh, you're dipping your feed into the pool in many, many different ways on, on a dock. And so it was great for me as a, as I've only been working for Cameron for, for a little over four years. So working on a documentary, um, has really taught me a lot and it's going to help me with, with the next thing we do. Um, just because it's, uh, you are doing, you are wearing so many hats. How did that relationship start with Cameron Crow? Yeah, there's a really long version and there's a really short version. Uh, but being that this is the Dream Path podcast, am I saying that right? Dream Path podcast. Yeah, let's yeah. go with the long version. Okay, I like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a banker by trade. I I'm like you. I'm a Seattle, Washington guy. I moved up to Seattle when I was a a, a young kid in the late '70s, and uh, consider myself a a Washington native. And uh, got into banking. Always loved film. Worked at a video store in high school up near my high school. Me too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worked at a, back when Blockbuster was all the rage, I worked at a, a smaller independent uh, video store called Bel Air Video. And I worked there for a couple of years, loved film, always loved film. I think, you know, like many kids, um, Star Wars was huge for me seeing it in the theater. Oh, yeah. I saw it, I saw it when I was six years old and 
it kind of blew me away. And what was that? 76 or something? 77. 77. Yeah. And, um, and then there was a few other films that kind of stick in my brain as a young kid. Jaws was one. Grease actually was another uh -huh. that, that, uh, really informed me as a little kid and, uh, always loved film and flirted with the idea of going to film school, but didn't. I ended up, uh, getting a job at a bank and kind of working my way up the, the ladder and, uh, really enjoyed that career. I, I My last job, uh, la a couple last jobs I had, I worked at BEC, which is the third largest credit union in the United States. It's Boeing Employees Credit Union. It's obviously headquartered up in uh, Seattle. And my last couple jobs, I I managed a large group of branches. I had a, you know, multi-million dollar annual budget that I was responsible for, you know, 80, up to 80 employees that reported up to me. And so managed that, did a lot of project work as well for the company. And so really got to, to do a bunch of different things and, and really loved the job, but had always wanted to be involved in film in some way. And so as a hobby in the uh, early 2000s, I, 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 when the internet was really starting to hop, I started a Cameron Crow website and it was called the uncool and named after a line in the movie almost famous and so i did it just for the heck of it i it was a fun diversion from my job and i was really taken by that film and he was in the middle of making vanilla sky and um but i i'd loved his films i'd loved say anything it was partially shot in seattle it came out the year i graduated from high school, yeah. uh, Fast Times was another thing that I remember vividly as a as a young, young, not quite teenager, and um, and then Singles was was a big thing up there because I was a big Pearl Jam fan and the whole grunge thing that was happening in the early '90s, and then Jerry Maguire. So th this is a guy that I loved his films, and I'm like, I'm going to build a website. It's going to be great for me. I, I built it on front page, Microsoft front page, <laughs> using a dial-up modem back before we we had wireless internet and all the, the things that we all take for granted now. And, um, you know, I figured best case scenario, he might see the site and send me an email and maybe I'd get to interview him for the site. Well, that happened pretty quickly. He was, I think, still filming or had just wrapped Vanilla Sky and, and, and reached out and said, I love the site. It's so cool. Thank you so much for doing this. And he was so, so genuine and so so nice about it. And then he started going all over the, the world promoting the film with Tom. And there's a really great DVD extra on the Vanilla Sky uh, DVD called Hitting It Hard, where you see like 20 minutes of them going from country to country, like promoting the film all over the world. And as Cameron would make stops in England or Spain or wherever, he'd email me and say, I'm in Spain, I'm in England. And he goes, everywhere I go, people come up to me and say they love the website. Oh my and, gosh. And that's you. And and so every, wow. you know, so he'd send me these very nice, very nice messages. And so I got to know him a little bit. We did some interviews for the website. He's just really, he's really fan friendly but he's a journalist at heart. So of course he, that kind of resonated with him, the idea of someone building this website for him. And um, so I got to know him a little bit and it was, it was great. It was just kind of a fun little thing. I was just doing it as a hobby. I think around 2005 when Elizabeth town came out, he asked me if I wanted to like run his official website, which he didn't have at the time. So we kind of built an official website with the help of uh, some other people and uh, we were, we had that for a while. It had like a message board and forums back when that was kind of a thing. And that worked for a few years. And then we decided that the blog blogging format was kind of taking off. It was so much easier to update the site and maintain the site. And so we, we blew up the official site and went back to kind of a blog. And I just continued to run it in my spare time for, gosh, a, about a decade. And then I went up to Toronto when Pearl Jam 20 came out because they debuted that at the Toronto International Film Festival. And I was hanging out with Cameron and I, I said, you know, if you ever need help, like more help, let me know. And, you know, I'd love, love to work for you in some capacity. And he said, oh, that'd be great. And, you know, we talked about it and I have a son with special needs and he was still in high school at the time. And the timing never quite worked out, but around 2000 and, uh, 14 um the opportunity presented itself he said do you want to do you want to work for me i'm getting ready to shoot a show called roadies for showtime 
And I said, yeah, let's do this. And so I like literally quit my job of 20 years. Banking. Banking. And um, it was a huge thing that I had to talk to my wife about. And, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just like start a new job and stay where you are. It was literally, I figured once I accepted the job with Cameron, I, there probably was no return. But you really never know, right? I mean, something could happen the next day and you could be looking for a job. And the question is, do you go back to banking or do you try to stick it out? I think if it would have happened earlier, I probably would have went right back to banking because that's what I know and that's what I'm comfortable with and that's where my skill set is. Um, I just got, I got lucky that Cameron, you know, saw something in me that he thought would translate into his world. Now, after four years, um, I feel confident that I could stay in this business. Um, but I really, I'm here for him. I, and this is, this is not, this is not a lie. This is not an embellishment of the truth. And it sounds a little cheesy, but I, I came down here to work with Cameron and to help him with his creative vision, you know, I just think it was the right opportunity at the right time. If it would have been somebody else, I don't think I would have done it. I think I would have been fine staying where I was. I loved Seattle. I love my life up there. Cameron is unique. He is really one of the good guys in the business. He's super approachable. He's super collaborative. He has got such an amazing reputation with um, studios, executives, actors, other writers and directors. You just can't find people saying a bad word about him in the industry. He's just one of the good guys. And so I knew that if I worked with Cameron, I'd be surrounded by uh, good people and it would be an industry you know, of, of good people. I just felt like he was the right person for me to work with, somebody that would be patient, somebody that would be uh, understanding, somebody that would allow me to make a mistake and um, I could learn from it and, and move on and grow. Um, you know, there are other people in this business that, you know, you probably wouldn't want to make a mistake around it. Maybe your last one. But with Cameron, I always knew that, uh, you know, he would be a collaborative uh, guy and uh, we would be taking this journey together. And I, I'm very lucky to have that opportunity. Yeah, you know, what I what I said to him was, "Can we try this for a year? I will stay in Seattle. I'll bounce back and forth as needed." So for a while, we were up in Vancouver filming the pilot for Roadies, and then I'll come down to California. We'll we'll figure this out. So we did that. I did that for a year. I flew back and forth. I one of the things I did initially, uh, in addition to helping on the show, was he needed someone to organize his archives. And with my background with the website, I knew practically everything you could know about his like journalism career, uh, all of the interviews he'd done over all the years with all the bands, all the movies, every, everything. And so uh, I, I went into the, the archives and they were a mess and there was no organization to them. And Cameron keeps everything, which is a blessing and a, and a, and a curse. So I sifted through everything and kind of organized everything by project. Uh, so not only like all the journalism together, but also like each movie together. Um, and he had, like I said, so much amazing material. He still has the original cassettes from when he went undercover back to high school to make Fast Times at Richmond High, the book. Yeah. So what he would do is he would go, he would go um, to class every day for a year. And when something interesting would happen, he'd go, he'd run to the bathroom and he would record into like a cassette deck what had happened. And he, he had all those original cassettes and he had every, he had all of his original cassettes from uh, doing the Billy Wilder book. And he had, you know, just, you know, early versions of all the films and all the dailies from all the films and all the, you know, all of his handwritten notes um, and all of the different iterations of the scripts. And, and so I, I organized everything. It took me probably a year of doing it, you know, in pieces. So I'd go down for like a week or two and I'd work straight, like 
10 hour, 12 hour days in the archives, organizing them. So you're digitizing things too at the I'm, same time? I'm digitizing some, not everything, but some of it's getting digitized, but everything's getting labeled and put into waterproof and um, acid free boxes if there's photo if there's photographs and things like that. And 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 what what this has done and, and we've we finally finished it. And um what it's been able to do is if if we have a new project, whether it's going back and doing like the 20th anniversary of the Jerry Maguire Blu-ray, I know where everything is. I can find everything usually in a couple of minutes. And so it's so great to be able to go, oh, I think I know exactly where your original mission statement is from Jerry Maguire, the handwritten version of the mission statement that you wrote. Or I know where all the dailies are. So if we want to call some new deleted scenes from the for the film, I can I can find that stuff, or I can find, you know, the casting footage of you know doing the the rehearsals or the casting of the film or whatever. So it it, it was great. So that was one of the first things I did. And then after a year, Rhodey's got the green light to go from pilot to ten episodes. And so that was kind of the moment where we we had to move. And so we moved from Seattle to to Los Angeles. And I immediately began working on the last or the remaining nine episodes of Roadies, which was like Baptism by Fire. I was a co-producer on that film and uh, or on that TV show. So I learned a lot as we went along making that. And then after that, we started figuring out what our next feature film was going to be. And then the Crosby thing kind of fell uh, to, to us. And, and that became my last two and a half years has been the Crosby film. Cameron's been very involved with the Crosby film. And at the same time, he has been uh, writing uh, Almost Famous, the musical for Broadway. So he wrote what they call the book, which is the basically the script. And then they've been writing new songs for the musical as well with Tom Kitt, who's a Tony Award winning lyricist. And so Cameron's been bouncing back between New York and LA, working on the musical, working on Crosby. And then at the same time, he's been writing uh, as well. So there's been a lot going on. It's been nonstop. And the company is just Cameron and myself. It's just two of us. We oh run, gosh. it's just the two of us now. And so, so what is the name of the company? It's Vinyl Films. Okay. And Cameron started the the company right around the time Almost Famous came out. He started the company Vinyl Films. Vinyl obviously being Cameron's love for records and, oh, yeah. and music. And so, yeah, it's just the two of us and we we can grow and, and, and shrink as we need to based on what the project is. But um it works really well, just the two of us, because we can bounce these ideas off each other and work in a really intimate way. You don't have to worry about staff and, you know, all of the headaches of, you know. No, that plenty of that happens when you're doing, when you're producing, whether it's the doc or a, a film, you're going to start right. dealing with, with you know, different departments and department heads and, and different uh, people working on the film. And so it's great to have people management skills, which, which benefited me. So I thought it was going to be a, a really dramatic change from what I used to do, but a lot of this stuff applies. So managing people, working with people, you know, trying to be a leader, managing a budget, a lot of that stuff applied, whether I was in the banking world or whether I was in a, a producerial role. So, um, so yeah, it's been, like I said, it's been great to, to, to be involved in a TV series and then now a documentary. And so the next thing for us is to to make a movie feature film feature film but then there's the musical as well which honestly i, I have not been involved with uh yeah that's really been cameron's baby but but yeah it's been kind of cool and there's other projects that we we have like i said we worked on a a reissue of the singles uh soundtrack and the the blu-ray um andy fisher who worked for cameron for for many years worked on that and i helped and then uh, Andy and I did the uh, Jerry Maguire 20th anniversary Blu-ray a couple years ago, which we're really proud of. And then, and then Andy went his way, and Cameron and I um, stayed, and and uh, announced just the two of us working on on new stuff. What an amazing journey to go from the banking industry, and just you know, you have this passion for film, and and kind of a a desire to make that leap, but you know, it it, it sort of comes to you in a way. I mean, you through your own passion and love for a body of work, Cameron Crowe's body of work, um, found a way to connect to him. And it didn't, it doesn't really sound that deliberate or intentional. Sure. Yeah. It just sort of happened. It did. And, and I think timing is everything. Um, I mentioned 2011 and, and if he would have offered me a job on the spot in 2011, 
I probably wouldn't have been able to take it because like I said, I had a, a son uh, with special needs that was still trying to get through high school and it wasn't the right time. But when the, when the, when it, the, the opportunity presented itself in 2014, it was the right time. And, uh, he was in college and he was doing well. And, and, uh, my wife and I were looking for something new and exciting and different. And boy, LA is that, I mean, <laughs> Seattle is, is crazy. And Seattle, as you know, has grown by leaps and bounds over the last five to 10 years with all the tech, whether it's, you know, Amazon or Expedia or Microsoft or Nintendo or whatever, it's the city has changed radically. It's, it's not the city that you see in singles or say right. anything anymore, but LA is a whole different level of crazy in terms of like being a, uh, such a busy bustling city. And, but I, I, um, honestly love LA a lot more than I thought. I thought, you know, it's going to be a necessary evil that I have to be in LA to do my job and I'll, I'll tolerate it. But when I got down here and started exploring the city and the neighborhoods and the architecture and stuff. I love it here. I think it's a great city. I think it's an underappreciated city. It, there's so much to offer here and more than just the beautiful weather, but there's just, there's just so much to do and so much to see. And it's such a diverse city. And, um, I've, I've learned a lot living here in the last three plus years and, uh, it's home now for sure. Now for people who are interested in breaking into the industry, um, into the film industry or television. Um, is it is it really important to be here physically? Yeah, to answer your question, I think LA is is ideal if you're down here and you want to break into the film business. I mean, as as I said, my story is certainly not conventional, but there's there's crazier ones. There's there's uh, John Peters, who's a producer who used to be Barbara Streisand's hairdresser. So he went from Barbara Streisand's hairdresser to a producer to at one point like the head of Sony Studios. <laughs> so I mean, there are crazier stories out there, but but yeah, I mean, um, what what I've seen from from most people is there are so many different opportunities in LA, whether it's working for a studio, whether it's working for one of the streaming companies that are that are you know becoming so prevalent now down here. But there are so many people that you run into here that are involved in the industry at, in some capacity, lawyer, agent, studio, accounting, what you name it. There, there, there's so many people involved in the film and TV business down here. So yeah, I think, I think most likely, you know, uh, film school, some people say that's a great way to go. Sure. I think that that is the right way for some people, but some people just come down here and just like try to break in and uh and and get a job as a production assistant on a tv show or on a movie and and then try to work their way up and i i, I always believed that if you work hard you keep your head down good things will happen to you and i think that that's i think that's no matter what business you're in i think if you if you you can stand out in a crowd i think i think it's still very possible to stand out in a crowd education helps film school helps being smart and talented helps, but, but yeah, being a hard worker, I think is, is still, uh, really important. Yeah. And, and it sounds like being, you know, physically near where, where the work is, I, you, you can't be, uh, you can, it sounds like, um, be in a different state or a different city, but this is where, um, the orbit of the industry is. It, it really is. I mean, I think I think you can have a successful career in Vancouver, British Columbia these days because there's so many shows that are shooting up there. And then Atlanta is the other big hub right now. There's a ton of movies and television being shot in Atlanta. I mean, all the Marvel movies are shot in Atlanta. A lot of TV shows are shot in Atlanta. A lot of movies are shot in Atlanta. There's good, they have provide really good uh, tax incentives to, to shoot in those places. So if it was me, I'd say one of those three places, LA, Vancouver, Atlanta are probably the best place to be. I don't think it gets better than LA, even if you then have to go shoot your show or your movie somewhere else to be able to be here um it's going to afford you probably the most opportunities it's not easy it's not easy yeah. for actors to try to break in down here it's not easy for cast or crew to, to try to break in down here um people always joke that uh actors especially you know you're taking the the cream of the crop from whatever city that actor grew up in maybe they were in drama maybe they're the best looking kid in their school maybe they were the best actor in their in their uh, theater but all the kids that are the best are all moving to LA trying to break into the business. So you've got the best of the best all fighting for these job opportunities. And I think it probably is the same thing for, for crew as well. Yeah. 
You, you talked about Roadies. Can you tell us what Roadies is and, and a little bit about that project? Yeah, Roadies was uh, Cameron's uh, television show for Showtime. It was 10 episodes. Uh, we, um, Cameron had, had, I think he was at a, a concert with J.J. Abrams. They've longtime friends. And uh, I think there was a, uh, a gal, like a, a, a lighting rig, she was up high, like above the stage before the show started. And she was like doing something up there with the lights. And JJ's like, I wonder what her story is. And Cameron's like, oh, well, she does this. And, you know, that guy over there does that. And, and you know, Cameron's been around the music business for so long and toured with all of these amazing bands like Led Zeppelin and the Eagles and, you know, you name it. And uh, JJ's like, I'd love to see a show about that. And so that's kind of how the story kind of got started. And so Cameron and JJ produced this show Roadies on Showtime. And um, Cameron ended up directing four or five of the episodes and then writing many of them as well. And uh, really, it's a very interesting look at the roadies that put together a concert, like what their jobs are, but just their inner dynamics and and the relationships that they have and being on the road full time and what that's like. And and we tried every episode to bring on a band, a different band to kind of uh, highlight their music, some, some established and some kind of up and coming bands. Some of my favorite bands of the last few years um, – I, I learned about on roadies. One of them uh, is Lucius, this amazing band with two uh, female singers that kind of sing everything together in harmony, which going back to Crosby, one of, one of his strengths was, was harmony. Yeah. But these two women, these amazing women that sing in this band called Lucius, they were on one of our episodes and I've fallen in love with that band and I've seen them in concert many times. But yeah, it was a show that uh, took a few episodes to find its feet. And I think it got better and better as the season progressed. And it, uh, you know, it was an hour long kind of comedy drama, which is kind of unusual. Usually those are half hours uh, when it's, when it kind of leans towards comedy. But uh, yeah, I'm really proud of the first season and it, it did, it just didn't do well enough to, to, to get a second season, but um, fond memories of that. And uh, it, working in television is very different from working in, in a movie or definitely a documentary. Those guys, put in amazingly long hours, 12, 14, 16 hour days, that crew bust their ass. They work so hard. And, um, it, you know, when you're shooting a, an episode of TV, you typically get seven or eight days to shoot one episode and then you're immediately on to the next episode. And then at the same time, somebody's directing an episode, someone's writing one, someone's in the edit bay working on the previous episode. And so it's just this constant machine that's going. And I have so much respect for uh, people that work in the TV business. A movie is very different. You're shooting a movie for, you know, two, three, four months, and then you're in the edit bay editing that one film until it's ready to go. With TV, it's like everything's happening simultaneously. And it is, it is a... Um, there were days I would come home at three or four in the morning and I'd be up at eight or nine off to, to shoot the next day. And, um, you have to have amazing stamina and, um, you have to take care of yourself because it's, I think it's really easy to, you know, um, really burn yourself out doing that. And that's why I'm just so amazed at these people that can, that can go from one TV show to the next crew typically yeah. that, that just work so hard and uh, they get used to it, and and uh, but it's it's mind boggling, and um, I I needed like a few months to recover from that kind of a, a job just because of the hours and the and so you know I was hoping we were going to sh- make a movie next, and then this Crosby doc came along, and so that's where we ended up going. So roadies, can people see that? Um, currently, or what? What is the status of yeah, that? Yeah, Rhodes, Rhodes is kind of in flux right now. Uh, I get this question a lot. I still run the Uncool in my spare time, so I get all the emails that come in, and I I, I don't post as much as I used to. The, the site definitely needs some TLC, but I get that question a lot. Like, where can I see Rhodes? And and the show was so expensive musically we had so many amazing songs in the episodes that we we 
have to clear them again for home video and we have to clear them again for like iTunes and digital mm. distribution. So right now the show is, you can't watch the show. It's not, Showtime's currently not running it and it's not available on Amazon or iTunes or home video. So we are, we are trying to do that. I'm working actively with Cameron and uh, to get the show put out, um, it's owned by Warner Brothers. They're, they own the show and they were, you know, licensing the show to Showtime. So Warner owns the show and I'm, we're trying to get the music cleared so that we can put the show out officially on home video and on iTunes. But right now it's sort of. Yeah. Well, that, that actually reminds me, I was going to ask you about the, the licensing and um, music rights issues for the David Crosby doc. Um, what were the the problems that you ran into in that documentary relating to the music? Yeah, music music is tough. Music is tough whether you're doing a feature or a doc because, um, you know, songs cost money. Artists deserve to be paid for their music. And you have to pay for the publishing so that whoever wrote the song, you know, gets paid. And then whoever performed the song gets paid. And so it is difficult to balance your budget and get all the songs in that you want. And with Crosby, um, and it's part of the story that we're telling, Crosby says early on in the film, the thing about, the re one of the reasons he's still touring, well, there's a few reasons, but one of them is that he says in the film, I was the guy in Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young that never had a hit single. And it's kind of true. Most of the big songs that those bands put out were written by Graham Nash or Stephen Stills or Neil Young. Crosby kind of always jokes, he wrote a lot of the weirder stuff and uh, more of the album tracks, but he's got, an, he's got an amazing collection of songs that he did write. I can't say that was always easy to clear because those guys have a contentious relationship still. Um, and that's part of what the film is about is their friendships being severed and uh and damaged at this point and um so yeah it, it was it was a give and take it was um you know really trying hard to lean on crosby's catalog as much as possible because we wanted to bring some of those maybe lesser known songs to audiences and go wow this is a great song i've, I've never heard this one before so we have some songs in there like you know page 43 or where will i be or, um, you know, there's some other ones that are a little more, a little more well-known like Deja Vu and Guinevere that, that Crosby wrote, but we wanted to, to highlight some of the other stuff that, 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 you know, Cameron is one of Cameron's favorite records of all time is if I could only remember my name, which is Crosby's 71 solo record. And that's a big piece of our movie is telling the story of how that record came to be. And Cameron loves that album. It's it's up there with like Marvin Gaye's What's Going On and on Cameron's shortlist, Joni Mitchell's Blue, some of his favorite records of all time. And and so we wanted to highlight that record. There's some great songs in there like Music is Love and Laughing. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was about kind of a mix of using Crosby's tunes and then uh, using some of his bandmates' tunes. And again, not always easy. It, it all worked out, but it wasn't always easy. Yeah. Well, what an ambitious thing for AJ to take on without the backing of a, you know, a production company or anything. And, uh, but it sounds like Cameron getting involved really allowed it to happen the way it did. It did. AJ did an amazing work building the foundation for that film and, uh, you know, putting his own money into it, trying to keep it going by going, I, I really need to film Crosby in the studio, or I really need to film Crosby at this concert. And so that's how it started. And then it, it's at, at a point he ran out of money and he needed to, you know, seek out financing. And he, he approached many, many a studio, many a production company trying to get money to continue filming, uh, the, the, the documentary. And, and as I said, when Cameron came on board, it sort of opened up some doors and allowed us to get a proper budget to be able to, you know, really take it from, you know, an idea with some footage to an actual, a film with, you know, these amazing interviews with David and Cameron. I, I've noticed an explosion in the number of documentaries out there. And maybe it's just because I'm seeing them on the streaming services and I never noticed them before, but my impression is... There's a lot of documentaries coming out and 
uh, I'm wondering though, why that would be if it's so difficult. I mean, it, it sounds like your, you know, your narrative uh, drama, original screenplay type of movie is just an easier thing to pull off logistically. Sure. Sure. It's a, it's a really good question. There's definitely been an explosion in music docs, I'd say in the last four or five years, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It, it's a lot of it's due to streaming services, wanting content, whether it's Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, CNN is doing a lot of music docs as well. Um, and you know, we've had some really successful ones like, um, uh, Searching for Sugar Man, which is a Sony Pictures classic film from a few years ago, which is amazing, and Twenty Feet from Stardom mm. that that won an Oscar, yeah. uh, the Morgan Neville film. So yeah, there there's been a lot. I think I think that from an outside point of view, people look and go, oh, it must be easy to make a music doc, quick and easy. You get the artist, you grab some friends, people he worked with, film them all, kind of tell their story, boom, release it. Well, as you said. Music music licensing is tough. It, I, I do think it's easier um, if everybody's getting along. <laughs> so that was our challenge, is right. Everybody wasn't getting along, and and so sometimes clearing the music was, was more difficult. Um, it could be easier if the artist is no longer with us, but that could also create additional hurdles if you're dealing with the estate of an artist. Yeah, and their so lawyers. It, yeah, yeah, and, and I, I do think the other thing is um, in terms of why they're so prevalent the last few years is people are really interested in a lot of these musicians and bands from the sixties and seventies. There's a, there's a nostalgia to it. There's also just, um, uh, there's a legacy. A lot of these artists are dying or a lot of these artists are, are, are on their last act. And so there's a lot of fascination with, with it. And we, we got lucky. We did not plan this at all, but you know, we're coming out this summer in theaters when Woodstock is hitting its 50th anniversary. And, you know, uh, the first Crosby stills and Nash record had its 50th anniversary last year and deja vu. The first CSN Y record has its 50th anniversary, uh, next year. And then David's first solo record, if I can only remember my name, has its 50th anniversary the following year. And so there is a lot of serendipity there that, that it all kind of happened and it was a plan, but it really wasn't. It just timing again was everything. And we just happened to get to, to get lucky. But um, that, that's why I think you're seeing a lot of these things, whether it's the new Scorsese documentary about Bob Dylan or, you know, there is a Woodstock documentary. There's also a Laurel Canyon documentary coming out later this year. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in, in this uh, and, and, and in these musicians. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of guys left that played at Woodstock, but Crosby's one of them. Yeah. And that's pretty, pretty cool that he's around to tell the story about something that stood out for him at Woodstock, which is not what you'd expect, which is in the film. Well, uh, you know, you mentioned searching for sugar man and, and this new Martin Scorsese, Bob Dylan documentary. I mean, I, I find myself, even though I love, um, dramas and comedies and and all kinds of film but i'm I'm watching more documentaries now than i've ever watched um and i think they're they're becoming more compelling uh because they're getting better at it and you've got people like scorsese and of course cameron crowe doing these music docs that are um just they 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 really pull you in and um I'm searching for the next one, you know, where, right. where's the next music doc. Right. And uh, so I'm glad you guys are putting out that content. It's just, it's great to see. Yeah. Uh, those are definitely, I, I'd say documentaries in general are a labor of love. You've got to have a, a genuine passion for the subject matter. And I think you have to be willing to put a spin on it because there has been so many, you don't want to fall into the trap of just a bunch of talking heads commenting on an artist a band it just it it feels it feels like it's been done a lot and so that was one thing that we tried really hard people ask us all the time like why don't you have new interviews with with neil or with steven or with graham well first of all we didn't ask those guys to do interviews yeah um they might have said no if we would have asked, but that was never the plan. The plan was always to let Crosby tell us his story because why would you not want to lean on this guy who can tell amazing stories, who has so much charisma, has so much honesty, and is such a great storyteller? So that's what that's 
what we tried to do with this film is really do that. Could you do that with every documentary? Probably not because you have to have a subject matter that can weave those stories. And I think Crosby is sort of in a league of his own in terms of being able to do that. Um, there's one documentary that I think was definitely an inspiration for us. And it was the Ginger Baker documentary that's on, I believe it's on Netflix. It may not be. I don't know. You'll have to look that up. Ginger Baker, a famous drummer, uh, worked with a lot of amazing bands in the 60s and 70s. It's a really interesting, very brutally honest documentary about him. He's still alive. He's not maybe as charismatic as Crosby, but he's certainly cranky. And he, it's a very honest doc. And it's something that we definitely uh, were inspired by when we set out to make this one. Hello, Dream Path listeners. I hope you're enjoying the interview so far. I'm sorry to interrupt the conversation, but I want to let you know that at this point in the interview, I ask a few questions that could be considered spoilers about the end of the movie. So if you're concerned about spoilers, you may want to fast forward about 30 seconds. My apologies for the interruption, but I hate it when I hear a movie spoiler without a warning. Now back to my talk with Greg Mariotti. Yeah, I, I think I remember a question at the Q&A at CIF at the, the premiere of the David Crosby doc, and someone said, you know, wh why didn't you um, go to Neil Young and see if you could just make this reunion, <laughs> this reunion happen? And, and, and of course, I too, as a member of the audience, I felt like I wanted that because we all, I think, we want it tied up nicely in a bow, right? You want this... This we think in terms of three acts for storytelling. You know, the final act is they reconcile. But of course, when you're doing a documentary, that you know, you're telling the truth. And the truth is that that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. And if the director or the, the producer tries to make it happen, you're losing the truth of, of the whole project at that point. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we did not want to manipulate the narrative in any way. And I think you said it best. I, I, I think the chances of, of those guys all putting their differences aside and playing together are pretty slim. If it happens, it happens. If our film in some way helps, great. But I love the idea that when you watch this movie that we're not we're just, we're telling the story and we're letting the audience decide what they think about Crosby, what they think about the situation and whether they think these guys are ever going to reconcile or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we wanted to, that's, that's the movie we really wanted to tell. And, um, and I think you can read the ending a few different ways when you watch the film. Um, and so it, it is a very, I think it's an, a pretty objective doc in that, in that respect. We're not, we're trying not to let the, let the audience uh, we're letting the audience choose how they want to interpret the film and how they want to see what happens happens. Cameron Cameron has joked that you know he'd love it if the movie was the doorstep for that relationship maybe getting repaired because um, he asked David that question in the film about showing up on Neil's doorstep. But maybe the movie showing up on Neil's doorstep may help yeah. do things. Maybe it won't. But. Um, yeah, I, I I think you said it well, and and um, I'm really glad we don't have a uh, an ending where you know Graham and David hug each other and everybody's happy. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that's real life, at least not right now. Yeah. Um, I, you can wish for it, you can hope for it, you can yearn for it, you can be emotional uh, watching those two guys in the film talk about it, but you know we'll see what happens. Yeah, so. As a producer, and um, as as Cameron Crowe's right hand man in, in Vinyl Films, um, are you are, are you finding yourself kind of um, going in the direction of um, writing and narrative films now? Um, now that you've been involved in the David Crosby doc, and wh where do you see yourself going in the next few years? Gosh, I, I tell Cameron this all the time. My, I feel like my role. Uh, in vinyl films is to just help Cameron execute his vision, uh, whether it's a doc, whether it's a feature film, whether it's a, a book project, whatever it may be, to be there to help, you know, clear away things, I use a football analogy to block for him, you know, just make sure that uh, he's able to 
be the artist that he needs to be. And, uh, and that, that's what I kind of see my role at. So I don't have aspirations to write or direct. My aspirations are to um, just help Cameron tell these stories and to contribute in, in that way for him and for vinyl. And just, you know, for us to tell as many great stories as we can. Cameron has a unique vision and, and uh, he's a unique storyteller. There's not a lot of uh, people that write the way he writes. And, um, you know, sometimes I think there's a tendency to go, well, he's a music guy. And that's true. We've done some music projects lately. Roadies was a music related project. Obviously, Crosby's a music related project. But Cameron has a lot of different ideas that that have really nothing to do with with music in terms of their subject matter. So we're hoping to do something non-music next. But I always think we'll circle back to music because it's just part of who he is and we both love music so much that it's going to play a part in, in the things that we do. But, but yeah, I'm excited to do something that that is completely different than the last few things that that he's done. Yeah, and now that you've made the leap from banking to film and and uh, helping Cameron execute his vision, do you see yourself being here through the retirement? I mean, is this it for you? I sure hope so. I really would like to continue producing until. Cameron has decided that he's had his fill or I've decided I've had mine. But yeah, I, I think this hopefully is my last act. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I do, I love it. I love movies. I love, I still, I, I have a voracious appetite. I'm constantly watching film. I'm constantly watching TV. I get so excited over something um, that's, that's fresh and exciting and new. I, 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 Every person I've ran into this year, when we talk about what have you seen or what'd you like, I, I immediately go like, have you seen Fleabag? Fleabag is like the thing that I tell everybody about. It's a TV show on Amazon that is British. It's, it's, it's where she breaks the fourth wall yes, or whatever. Yes, it's, yeah. uh, it's written and, and stars uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She's an amazing actress and writer. She also wrote the first season of Killing Eve, and she's actually working on the new Bond, James Bond movie, writing it. She's such a fresh voice, and that Fleabag show, blew me, it just blew me away. The first season is really good television. The second season is perfect. It's, yeah. it's perfect television. It's perfect anything. It's the best single thing I've watched this year. And so I get really pumped up over something uh, – new like that, that, that just kind of knocks my socks off. And so I'll, I'll continue to, uh, you know, read and, and, and watch, um, and, um, you know, hopefully that, that will keep me inspired along with whatever Cameron and I are working on, but, um, I love film and yeah, I can't imagine anything more exciting for me than to continue to do this until I'm ready to, you know, sail away into the sunset. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Fleabag and, and the quality of television series these days. And I, I think I date it back to, um, through my lens anyway, I date it back to The Sopranos. Sure. And that, that sort of long form, um, you know, the, the character arcs that take seasons to develop and the, the storytelling that's involved in, um, in that craft. And you, you would think that, you know, I, I guess television used to be for me like Hill Street Blues or ER or something like that. And then, you know, Sopranos happens and HBO just takes it to a whole new level now in Showtime, of course. But um, I think it's elevating storytelling across the board. I mean, I, I think movies are now feeling or you know, movie studios are feeling the pressure to um, to up their game. Yeah, and it's also it's providing a lot of opportunities for writers and directors and actors to spread their wings into different areas with all these all these new channels and all these new streaming outlets. It's just giving people more opportunities to tell compelling stories. And I agree with you and and um you know, some people are like Netflix, Netflix and 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 uh, they they fear this this new stuff. I, I embrace it. I think it's great. It, it, it creates more jobs. It creates more stories. And um, it also fills holes that, you know, a lot of plays, a lot of studios don't want to release smaller budget films. A lot of studios don't want to release non-superhero films. And so this gives 
other outlets for writers and directors to be able to tell those stories on maybe a smaller scale that would have maybe fallen through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So that's that's fantastic. I, I'm with you. Sopranos was an early, um, I think, um, touchstone show for me. Um, that's that would be on the list, but also things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer mm -hmm. and uh, Firefly. Those those uh, Joss Whedon shows were were really important to me in my my early twenties and. Um, and then, gosh, over the last few years, yeah, I've really, you know, Breaking Bad and Justified and, um, you know, some of the amazing stuff that's sh shown up on HBO, The Leftovers. And I I'm a big fan of Lost on ABC uh -huh. when that was on the air. And and um, there's been some really, really, really good television. And um, right now it's all about Fleabag, though. <laughs> I'll have to watch it. I watched the first episode and, you know, the breaking of the, they call it the breaking of the fourth wall. And if I think if you can get past that, you know, you it's it's probably worth it. But for me, I watched that first episode. And I'm like, okay, I've got so much television to watch. I mean, I've got a queue that's a hundred a <laughs> hundred shows long or something. And so I put it on the back burner. But now that you mention that you, you're such an enthusiast, I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch it. It's it's yeah. it's. I've heard people say the first episode. Well, the first scene of the first episode can turn some people off too. It's pretty hardcore pretty quickly, and the fourth wall is is an issue for some people as well. I think what's great about Fleabag is it's it's a short show. It's like 25, 30 minute episodes. And I'd say around episode three, the show really hits its stride. And by the end of the first season, you're just like, give me more. And then it got to the point for me that when I started the second season, again, there's six episodes seasons, 30 minute episodes. You're talking about less than three hours for each season. So, Cause that's how they do it over there in the UK. But I got to the second season of the show and it was so good that I turned to my wife and I said, we have to slow down. I don't want to watch this. I don't want to binge this in one day or two days. It's so good. I want to take each episode in. I want to savor it. I want to talk about it. Maybe we can watch one episode every four or five days. I just That's the one thing about what's happened with, with Netflix and Amazon that I don't really like. I'm not a binge guy. Mm. I'd much rather take an episode, watch it, let it sink in for a week. And then maybe even talk about it with people that I know, have that water cooler moment. Those are becoming really hard to do now, unless you're on regular television or HBO is still honoring that, whether it was Game of Thrones or Big Little Lies Now or whatever they've got, where they're only putting out an episode every week. I, I like that approach because it gives you a chance to really absorb it. What I find is when I binge a show, a really great show like Ozark on Netflix, by the time the next season comes around, I've forgotten what's happened. Yeah. I have to watch like a 20 minute recap or I'm completely lost. And so that's the other thing about, about Fleabag is just being able to, to, to try to slow down and, and really enjoy each episode because I know there's no more coming. She said she's not doing anymore. And I just wanted to take each episode and, and savor it. Yeah. And uh, like I said, it's by far the best thing I've seen on TV or in the movies this year. And, um, so many good British yeah. shows. I mean, my wife is any, anything that she'll, she'll search in, in Netflix, you know, a British drama and just looking for anything that comes out of BBC because it's so high quality. But, um, the, the industry, the United Kingdom film industry and television industry, is it, is it completely separate from Los Angeles and Hollywood, or is there some overlap there? Uh, you know, I'm I'm not a complete expert on the subject, but I think for the most part, it is completely separate. And when you see a show like Fleabag on Amazon, I believe that Amazon is just licensing that show from the UK. Uh, even things like Black Mirror on Netflix. I believe that's all shot in the UK and and they've they've got a deal now, I believe, with Charlie Brooker, who's the creator of Black Mirror. But whether it's Luther, which I really love, or Broadchurch or any of these BBC shows or ITV shows over in England, most of them we're just getting lucky to be able to watch them on BBC America or yeah. on Netflix or on PBS or wherever they may land. Oh, Luther's great. Broadchurch is great. Yeah, good shows. Yeah. Really, really good shows. Yeah, it, it sounds like your your passion for film 
and for storytelling, even though you yourself don't have aspirations to be a writer, but just your love of film and television and also of Cameron's body of work was a was a big factor for how you kind of fell into this this industry because it, it doesn't it doesn't really sound like you sought it out you know no I really wasn't I wasn't pursuing it um you know I loved collaborating with him on the website and I got to know him not 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 as well as I know him now yeah but you know well enough to know that he was a good a good person a genuine person and um and I I I I knew that I could bring value to his life and to his career outside of the website. Uh, and I knew I had some skills. Um in the last 4 years, um you know, I I'm a little more creative than I thought I was, which is kind of something I've learned about this process. Um meaning that you know, I may have a good idea here or there in terms of something we're trying to do in terms of telling the story. I thought maybe I'd be more like the business guy, like more of the the banker, know, the banker, the yeah. or, the organizer, the uh, the guy that gets things done, the project manager, whatever you wanted to call me. I thought I'd be kind of leaning more on that side, and I, I feel like I can do those things. I can manage a budget. I can I can help uh, you know make sure the production stays on track. But uh, that's the one thing that's probably surprised me the most is that you know being my love for for films and my knowledge of films that that uh, occasionally I'll throw out a good idea. And that's the thing about Cameron. It's like, he, he's willing to listen and and uh, acknowledge other people's ideas, not just mine, but people he's collaborating with, whether it's an editor, a producer, a, a boom mic operator. He, he he doesn't care if it's a good idea, he'll he'll embrace it and and uh, and run with it and make you feel good about your contribution. So yeah, and it sounds like you're you're kind of absorbing a lot of information every time you're working on a new project you're learning about how things are getting done and that's helping you become more of an asset to Cameron and in vinyl films and it's a it's an evolutionary process it sounds like yeah i hope so i mean that that is the goal and as i said i, I tell cameron all the time you know i'm going to make a mistake and i'm going to learn from it and then we'll it'll it'll make us better in the long run and and uh you know none of us are infallible we're all learning we're all growing if we're not it is time to look in the mirror and go, am I in the right job now? If I'm, if I'm not learning anymore, if I'm not growing anymore, um, and if I'm just satisfied doing the status quo, then maybe it's time to shake things up. And, and, uh, boy, I, I really did shake things up and I, I have no regrets. It's been such a fun journey for me. And this movie has been a, a really amazing journey. I'm very excited one of the things that Cameron and I hoped would happen is that this movie would see a theatrical release. A lot of documentaries go straight to streaming or straight to a pay channel. And we really wanted people to have a communal experience in the theaters and enjoy the music and the and the emotion of this film together in a dark theater. And I'm so excited that we found a partner in Sony Pictures Classics. They completely got the movie. They saw it at Sundance and fell in love with it and said, we really want this movie and we want to put it in theaters. And that's exactly what we wanted. And so I just feel like we have had a nice little uh, run with this film. And I'm hoping that people go next month, July 19th uh, is when it hits New York and LA, and then it'll expand to many, many cities after that. But hoping people go to the theater and, and see this movie because there is nothing still quite like watching a movie with a group of people. I mean, there are times when I'd rather be at home on the couch because the person next to me is chomping on their popcorn too loud <laughs> or there's a kid crying. I saw Toy Story 4 yesterday and there was a little kid that was crying and talking through the film. But you put that stuff aside and being able to laugh and cry in a theater is is still pretty special. Yeah. And you can't get that at home. Oh, I agree. Yeah. And seeing seeing the David Crosby doc in, in the theater was really special. So I encourage people to go out and do that. And um, I really appreciate your time today, Greg. Thanks, Brian. No, this has been fun. And uh, uh, maybe we'll have something to talk about again in five or 10 years. Yeah. But, uh, well, I'm sure there will be with all the projects you're working on. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Dream Path Podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. 
Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time. And as always, go find your dream path.